So welcome everyone to this M Enabling Europe virtual leadership briefing celebrating the Web Accessibility Directive anniversary. That is a very long name of this event. Uh, I want to start with some housekeeping. Uh, we do provide live closed captionings today. So just use the CC uh, button on your uh, screen to get the live captions. We are also providing translations of those captions into French, German, Spanish, and Swedish. And Rachel will post the links to these translations in the chat in a while. Um, my name is Susanna Lorin. I'm the G3ICT and uh, IAAP representative to the EU. And I want to give you a little bit of background to the long name. Uh, during many years, the uh, UN Initiative for Global Inclusive ICTs, uh, G3ICT and EG Kraus, have been uh, organizing the M Enabling Summit in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. Uh, in, normally in June every year. But because of you know what, uh, we have been providing instead some virtual uh, events over the year. And in two weeks, from the 4th to 6th of October, uh, we will actually do a real face-to-face um, -face, um, uh, summit in Washington. And for all of us who unfortunately can't travel to the US right now, there's also a virtual pass. So uh, the, the theme of the, of the M Enabling Summit this year is strategies for inclusive digital transformations. And we have moved the whole M enabling concept to Europe starting in uh, 2018 with a face to face event in Brussels. Now we're doing this anniversary event and then we will do another hopefully face to face event in Brussels in the first week of December when we celebrate the European Day of Persons with Disabilities. So enough of all these uh, marketing pieces. Um, we are very happy today for this event, which is sponsored by Google, AbleDocs, and T-Mobile. And we will have representatives from our sponsors also participating in the uh, breakout sessions later on. So the celebrations of uh, the Web Accessibility Directive uh, anniversary is not only champagne and fireworks, it's also a lot of uh, hard work. So uh, a lot of stakeholder consultations is going on uh, and this event is one part of that where you can have your say and really let everyone know about your experiences and thoughts about the pros and cons of the directive. And we will have a presentation around that and kind of set the scene for this, uh, this whole discussion part uh, from the most suited person, I would say, uh, the head of unit for the DG Connect of the European Commission, uh, June Laurie Kingston. But no matter how important policy, regulation, standards, technology, the inner market, and all of this is to all of us, uh, we still need, I think, to start with the real essence of accessibility, the humans. So therefore, I am very happy to introduce to you the keynote of today. Um, one of the most inspiring speakers in our community, my dear friend, uh, who is also the second vice president of the European Blind Union, Barbara Martinez Munoz. So please, Barbara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susana. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. It's a great day, an important day. And uh, there won't be any sharing uh, screen with my presentation. So your task is not to fall asleep. So you will have to decide if I'm, I'm that inspiring or not. So here we go. My name is Barbara, as you know, I'm 47, I'm partially sighted, I'm Spanish, I speak English and Italian, and I have a law degree and another one in political science. I am telling you this just to give you an idea how lucky I have been to be able to study what I chose in, in first place and to be able and be curious enough, regardless of my law vision, to keep, us, to keep on learning uh, during my whole life in second place. Thanks to ONCE, the Spanish National Organization of the Blind, I have been working at international level for many years now, and I have always bared in mind that for us, blind and partially sighted people in Europe, 30 million citizens, technical solutions are part of the equation not to leave us behind. With technical solutions, I mean all it takes to make universal accessibility real from the very beginning, whatever device we use, to the very end when users interact with it or through it. You already know that I'm the second vice president of the European Blind Union. So you may think, well, 
this puts you in a privileged position and you are very right. I know more things regarding the directive than regular users, but the good news is that today I'm not here to talk about what I do know, but as a regular user, because at the end of the day, what, that's what I am, a user, a citizen, a patient, or a student. I am pretty sure that when you access to the internet, in general, you don't find problems caught in doubt with things like uh, being able to access to the content of the information you need, to finish in the task you need to do, or being able to pay on your own and in a secure manner your taxes. Well, in my case, these are the minimum of things I have to face and because I am a partially sighted who needs a screen reader. And what shocks, me the, what shocks me the most is that all these things are relevant, not temperamental. In fact, they are a matter of human rights. At this stage, I don't need to remind you that web accessibility increases inclusion, autonomy, and participation in general. And in particular, in this digital world we are living in, moreover, and always, under the CRPD principle of own and obligations, such as Article 9 and 21 regarding access to information. The theory is clear. Web accessibility should allow everyone to perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with, inter with the internet, whether you use a computer, a tablet, a smartphone, any device. But in practice, it's quite a way from Far, far away from, um, from what is, is in reality. And we all know this, don't we? I know this is going to the point, but being honest with you all, I cannot think of a better day and a better environment to say it out loud. We have a director after all, um, that seems that is working, but needs to be applied well by all public and private stakeholders linked to the public authorities, whether they are national, regional, local. So my motivation is clear. Be contrast, constructive and practical, not technical. So don't forget this, okay? That's important. And don't misunderstand me because today we are celebrating the anniversary of the Web Accessibility Act uh, Directive and I am happy. How could I not be? But we cannot conform only to comply with the technical part of it, no way. Not me, not EBU. In fact, from EBU, we are very concerned about the challenge of accessing to information, again, whether it's private or public. All members uh, do invest a lot of time and resources in TICs and tools to guarantee that blind and partially sighted people participate in the 21st century digital world and as an, any other citizen, no matter what accessible format we need. We are living in a very increasing and very um, rapidly uh, digital world. And all of us, and I mean it, all of us, had to learn faster than expected, not only a lot of um, a new ways of communications, but also how to rely on digital service in general. Nothing more and nothing less. So let's think um, of what brings us together here, accessibility of web access app, app, web pages and apps. I would like to highlight, first of all, that even though we talk about them as they are accessible, in reality, we mean they comply with a high or a low level of accessible guidelines. This tinge is quite obvious, but it is crucial to make sure that we are in the same page. So the key question would be, how is the situation after the directive entering into force? Well, I think, and I guess in general, it is better. Well, after all, when there's a compulsory law on board, it is for the better. However, at least from my point of view as a user, it's not enough. Let me give you some uh, general example for good and bad uh, Spanish public web pages. I know you're waiting for them. Okay, the first one would be the Spanish the, I, I would start for the good ones because they are less. <laughs> uh, the first one would be the Spanish Prime Minister website. It, it has really a good level of accessibility, but when it refers to the videos, um, it is not that good because um, there are uh, because of the of, uh, of due to the inaccessible screen playback controls 
settled. And the other good way, uh, example would be the Senate page, web page. In general, it's very accessible, but for example, here you can find that the heading structure is not correct in the main page. And there are links that are not associated with um, a logical text. In any case, they can be followed. So, okay. Let's go to the bad examples. Uh, the very top is our Spanish tax agency web page. I'm not going to go into details here. Spanish Congress of Deputies. Well, here there's bad functionality, documents are not accessible, among, among many others. Regarding the Spanish public job portal, here is very funny because as, a, my, as I'm using a screen reader, a screen reader, here the form to fill in is not visible for the screen reader. So thank you very much for your help. I cannot do it. Well, and uh, website, the web page to request, for example, the minimum uh, vital income, which nowadays is unfortunately quite common in Spain, we find that there are users uh, of screen readers who's, or those who suffer from color blindness or those who use the keyboard only um, to, 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 for the input device, we will encounter problems for prevent, that prevent them from carrying out a simulation of the minimum in, in, in income that they uh, would receive. Uh, and also they, there are some access um, problems with the information in general, and even to be able to process, process it. And of course, apps. Uh, here, I will give you a unique example. I like this example because it's about a health public app that, turned, that was born absolutely inaccessible and nowadays is accessible. That is the Spanish rather COVID app. I bet you have one of, the, of these uh, at your countries uh, similar. Well, in this case, um, this is the official app of the Spanish uh, government to receive notifications if you have been in contact with someone who has been diagnosed positive for COVID. It use was meant to be anonymous, secure, confidential, and voluntary. Well, it seems to me important enough to have been developed accessible from the very beginning, right? Well, it was not, as I was saying. It was created in September 2020. Once they perceived important problems with accessibility, so they, um, I mean, such as, I'm going to, 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 to name them because they are relevant, such as the inaccessible buttons that prevented us to uh, confirm the verification of conditions. So the very first step of the app and there were many misled uh, items through all the, the, the process. So what Onte did was contacted to the big private Spanish company that developed it and, and tell them and warn them about this. And what was the response? Thank you for your comments, but this is not our priority right now. Yeah, astonishing. I mean, it's unbelievable. Well, Onte didn't uh, doubt it and wrote immediately to the minister, and two days later, the developer was in touch with ONCE to work all kinds of accessible issues. By December 2020, the majority of problems were solved, and by March 2021, Spanish blind and partially sighted people could use it as the rest of citizens. Six months later, I like the sample, this is sample because it's a bad one and everyone should uh, learn from it. And uh, even though there's a positive thing, I am, I'm going to be fair. And from the strict legal point of view, the app was accessible three months before the deadlines, deadline given by the, uh, by the directive to be. Uh, I want to uh, give you some input so we can learn from them. The minister would have not given this developer, the contract to develop it because it wasn't accessible. I mean, uh, this is, should be in first place. We need this accessible. Um, this should have been one of the inexcusable, re inexcusable requirements of many other are. So um, there's no way, there's no excuse. Um, so if, if it was, if it had been put in place from the very beginning, not only blind and partially sighted, but also the rest of people with disabilities could have been using it at the same time on their own as the rest of citizens. The example shows 
always as well, that developers, developers can do whatever they develop accessible from the beginning. In the majority of cases, I know it's a, mar a matter of ignorance, not only the fact that accessibility is compulsory, but also that people with disability represent 15% of the population in the EU, EU and their representative organizations are their best ally. And they do, and they know, and they know what they need. So you need them to contact them and do things right from the very beginning. I bet this example, this app would have been less expensive to developer to be to be developer developed developed if it was born from the very beginning accessible. Having said that, let's move to what really it's important for me as a user, who I contact with to complain what problems or to explain my problems, trying to find uh, the information I need or to pay my taxes. I mean, you, you, every time I get to this point, um, I, I think things like, okay, there should be a visible place in a visible place in the menu of each web page and the app, something like report accessible problems. Otherwise, if you don't know it exists, there's no way you can complain or you can try to help the, the, the technicians to sort it out because you don't know who to talk to. And when reporting the problems, the developer cannot expect from us uh, to be technical. So we really need to work here to find an accessible, easy, guided application form or something like that so that the user can uh, write it and send it to the technician and the technician be in touch with that person or organization or whatever to make things you know, a feedback uh, and, and do it quickly and do it in a, in a smooth way. I know it is very complex and it requires training, not only for the organizations of people with disabilities, but also from the organizations to their users so that the whole chain of people concerned are uh, aware of it. So um, let me say it here if I may, but sometimes the problem is that technicians and users, we do speak different languages and we don't understand each other. So we need to find a, a, a joint point where uh, to, to understand each other. We are not confrontated. We, both of us want to, to, to move on. Again, as a user, I notice uh, that from time to time, there are things in apps and web pages that change. It's logical is to introduce any kind of improvement, improvements. Well, please, when doing it so, do not forget to keep on updating accessibility features. Do not delete them, because if you do so, again, you are leaving us behind and we are not getting benefit from the improvement you are doing. When I listen, for example, to monetary agency claiming that it is too time consuming to audit the small number of websites they are obliged to monitor, or when we argue with public sector bodies who claim it's too cumbersome, to remediate inaccessible parts of the website? I don't think, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what to think. I don't know if I have to be sad, surprised, angry. I mean, is that possible that in 2021, we are still on the, in their post, in their point? I think you, you realize that really, I, I do believe in policies and regulations and I am happy we can celebrate the application, the, the, the application of the web accessibility directive today. But I think it has arrived the time to start focusing as well on users, the real beneficiaries of it. And by users, I mean all type of users. Without, without us, how will the public sector survive? What, call, what could we call it if part of us, 15% of the population are excluded? It is time really to make the real difference with the so-called digital experience. Let's make it all among, among, all, among all a good one. I know there's the consultation for the implementation of the directive that will provide us a valuable ideas and uh, information. I don't want to go through this because uh, our next speaker is, is his space and I don't want to invade it. But uh, mm, uh, the result of the, 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 of the consultations are very expected and we have to be very uh, positive and reactive and you know, constructive with whatever the, those are. 
And before finishing, because I don't want you to, 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 to go, go fall asleep, as I said before. Uh, and now, yes, I'm some second vice president of the European Blind Union. I would like to be very clear. We need to start to stop talking on web accessibility in the very near future, because from now on, it should be included in the web app concept. concept. Full stop. That's it. I mean, it's hard to hear, but that's the way it is, at least nowadays in the public sector. But before that, we have a long journey ahead of us. I know I'm concerned about that and, I'm, and, and, and we need to start raising awareness on how and to whom to report all type, of, all type of problems of accessibility and do it all together. Public authorities, developers, industry, uh, entrepreneurs, organizations of people with disabilities, users, because we are in the same boat here and we cannot sink, we cannot afford that, can we? Meanwhile, it is time to thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity to give my constructive perspective uh, of, the, uh, the, uh, of, the, the, of the directive. And I do wish you all a very happy anniversary directive day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. That was fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing all your views with us. And I like, I like many of the quotes that I will steal from you, if I may. So don't be technical. I like that one because that is really what this is all about. And I think hopefully the IAAP, the efforts we are doing in training and certification will in time make sure that no more companies like the one providing the inaccessible uh, COVID app in Spain, I mean, in a couple of years, hopefully they will be trained and, and they will have certified accessibility experts among them. Uh, and, and also the procurers will be able to, to find experts. Uh, if we succeed with, with making sure that the accessibility experts are, are out there, then there are more boots on the ground and then together we can, we can make this happen. But I also agree with you, of course, the end user organizations are extremely important. And to all the public sector agencies out there, hey, these are the uh, expertise you get for free. Be happy about the feedback mechanism because that is that is not a problem. <laughs> it's really it's really a consultation for free. So then you don't need to pay even for the the expensive accessibility uh, specialists. So so take advantage of the feedback mechanism and make that clear and visible to everyone so that so that we get a good uh, a good circle of of people helping each other to make sure that we move towards inclusion. Okay, so. Now we have kind of set the scene with the end user requirements and a lot of, of uh, commitment from Barbara and everything we <laughs> kind of need to do. And now we turn to another very dedicated and committed uh, person who is also one of the decision makers uh, in, this, uh, in this field. So very happy uh, to have June Laurie Kingston with us today. And thank you very much again for taking time to be here. I know you have an absolutely crazy schedule. Um, but we will hear uh, from June about the Web Accessibility Directive one year on and uh, to set the scene and, and kind of get us in the right mood for the breakout discussions. So please, June, the floor is yours. I will do my best. Can you just confirm, Susanna, that you can see my screen? I don't I always have this problem with the big, long, big black lines at the top. I'm not really sure how to get rid of them, but uh, I hope that's uh, not going to be disturbing. Is that OK? We see your screen fine. Okay, grand. Okay, so let's get going. So first of all, thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Barbara, for that really inspiring and really important keynote speech. Greatly appreciated. And I was taking lots of notes, Susanna, as well as, as you of the quotes and what to very, very useful uh, feedback there. Thank you, Barbara, a million. Thank you also, Susanna and IAAP and all involved in organizing this event. As you say, on an auspicious day, the 23rd of September. Um, I'm June. I work for DG Connect within the European Commission. And among my great uh, pleasures of work is responsibility for the Web Accessibility Directive, as well as language technologies and safer internet. Now, if I can just get the screen to move on, I really have three messages, two and a half messages messages even. So I hope you're all going to remember this. First of all, although we're going to spend most of the afternoon talking about the Web Accessibility Directive, that is really just one little corner, one little strand of a much bigger picture as the EU, the Commission at least, tries to achieve a union of equality. We're going to talk a little bit about the WOD review, where we are, what's still happening, and then really I need you. I need your help to help us get the public consultation that are online 
as representative and as full of good insights and information. And as Susanna said, this free feedback to us, as well as to all the member states and everyone involved in implementing the Web Accessibility Directive. Let's try and get that as complete and as representative as possible. So three messages. First of all, what do we mean by this uh, union of equality and how does this fit in this big picture? Well, under the current president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, when she set up or was being appointed as commission president, she um, has a document which was about her political headline ambitions. And she stated very clearly in there already, we need equality for all and we need equality in all of its senses. And she also, another political headline ambition was Europe fit for the digital age. So for those of you who are more techie minded in the audience today, you may have heard about the digital decade communication, the digital compass, the fact that we hope to have digital principles being adopted uh, before the end of this year between the Commission, the Parliament and the Council. Um, and this is all about this digital transformation, as Barbara men mentioned, ramping this up, pushing this forward to 2030, hence this being the digital decade. And using the unprecedented funding from the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which is money made available to the member states to recover from the impact of coronavirus, to proceed at pace with an inclusive digital transformation. So that's on the sort of digital side of things and the digital transformation side of things. But on the other side of that same coin, the same commission president, um, is very, very committed to a union of equality. Now, I don't expect everyone listening saw the president giving her State of the Union speech last Wednesday morning at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. I've put the link in my slides because, especially at the end, I found it a truly inspiring speech that of all the people in Europe that she invited to be her guest of honour, she invited an Italian Paralympian athlete, a young woman. and. That for me really shows the type of person that President von der Leyen is, the type of priorities she has and what is important to her. And I think it shows her really walking the talk, as we say in English, towards this union of equality. This matters to her and it matters to her in how she set up the college. So we have a commissioner dedicated to equality for the first time ever. Um, who is tackling discrimination on the six formal grounds defined in the treaty, which is sex, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, age and disability, which, of course, is why we're all here today. And so it's no surprise that the new strategy on tackling disability is called the Disability Rights Strategy running from this year to 2030. And I put the links there to the strategy and also to the easy to read version of the strategy. And on top of existing legislation, of which in the digital sphere, we actually have a fair amount. We have legislation on emergency numbers under the European Electronic Communications Code, Audiovisual Media Services Directive, obviously the Web Accessibility Directive, also the Marrakesh Treaty. They are the pieces of legislation handled by DG Connect from the digital point of view. But the really big game changer, I think, will be the European Accessibility Act when it hits its practical implementation in 2025. So still a few years off, but you know the wheels of EU legislation grind very slow. Um, so we have this legislative package, we have the strategy, and we have also, I think, really the prioritization and the, atten the political attention these subjects are getting within the Commission, as reflected by the fact that every part of the Commission has to have an equality coordinator. I have the pleasure of doing that for DG Connect. And that we meet to talk about all the work that the Commission is doing on tackling all six grounds of discrimination. Um, and that we are really trying to, I think that gives certainly accessibility in all its forms and diversity in terms of also our internal recruitment, as well as uh, preaching to the outside world. It just gives it much more political attention than it's ever had before. So in that point of view, it's a very inspiring and it's a very um, positive time to be working in the Commission. But if we turn then to that one strand of the Web Accessibility Directive, uh, on the slide here, you see the years in the middle, 2021-22, 20, 
Above that are the formal dates that are come primarily from the Web Accessibility Directive. And underneath are the more practical dates, the deadlines leading to the review, which has to be delivered by 23rd of June next year. So why is today such an auspicious day for the directive? What is it that we're celebrating in terms of an anniversary? Well, the directive was actually published in 2016. So, you know, getting on six years ago, five years ago, which is light years ago in terms of technology. But 23rd of September 2018 was the date by which all member states had to transpose the directive into national legislation. We know they all didn't make that date, but they all have made it now. And 23rd of September last year, was the date by which all websites of public sector bodies at any level of public administration had to be accessible. Now, as we've heard from Barbara, we haven't got a magic wand. That didn't happen on the 23rd of September, 2020, but the legislation we think is a necessary and essential, if not a sufficient condition for bringing that change about. And we know that member states are working on this and are taking that seriously. 23rd of June this year was the date for mobile apps, which makes perfect sense of what Barbara was saying in terms of technical uh, abidance by the directive, but clearly, the fact that apps are still being developed, that websites are still being put online that haven't got accessibility hardwired in from the start is very disappointing, if not perhaps altogether surprising. Um, and the other date that I just want to mention, because uh, it might cause a little bit of confusion, is that in 12th of August, so just last month, we published an updated harmonized European standard, which is the Etsy standard EN, I'm going to check my numbers here, 301549 version 3.2.1. That is now of relevance to the Web Accessibility Directive to give a presumption of conformity, meet the relevant bits of that standard, you'll conform with the WAD. But because the member states have to report in December, because they've been working to the previous standard, which was version 2.1.2, there is inevitably and understandably uh, overlap time. So the updated standard becomes the only standard applicable next February. So the member states reporting, which is due by the end of this year, will basically be on the previous standard version 2.1.2. So I hope that's clear in terms of what the the directive is, what are we doing to hit this review date of June next year? Well, at the moment, as I will talk about in much more detail for the rest of the time allotted to me, we have a public consultation open, and I can only encourage you all to take part and to encourage anyone you know who's interested in accessibility to take part as well. In the next quarter, which starts really in about, what, 10 days time, we will have consultations with other stakeholders, industry, public sector bodies, persons with disabilities and organisations representing them primarily. Um, so that will take us through to the end of the year. And then with our contractor, we'll be looking at all this wonderful information and feedback we've gathered and the member states reports, pulling that together in the first quarter of next year. And then we have the deadline of 23rd of June to publish the review. So this is our work, where we are and what is uh, important about the 23rd of September. So a word about the public consultation, and I think hopefully this fits in with what Barbara was saying, where some things can be accessible, but they're not really accessible. And how do we actually rethink uh, accessibility in terms of public information and public interaction with the public sector? So because we're an EU administration, it's a formal review, it's linked to a piece of legislation, we have to do a formal review and we have to jump through those formal review hoops. So that means we have to use uh, the Have Your Say platform, and that comes with the EU login. Now, you may or may not have had the pleasure of doing that. We are well aware that there are some technical accessibility limitations with that. And so it was very important to us, to me and my team, that we came up with a complementary format for gathering feedback from that. And so we worked hard to get 10 questions in an easy reading format with absolutely minimal personal data being gathered so that we could run that outside the Have Your Say portal domain. 
Um, and as you see from the chart here and from the notes that are in the, in the underneath, we basically have a very, very clear divide that a lot of people are using the easy reading version of the survey, which makes us feel very, very pleased that we insisted on this. Um, and we hope that there are some lessons from this that we can feed back into our colleagues responsible for public feedback and communication in general. So at the moment, as things stand, we have about seven out of 10 users completing the easy to use survey and about three out of 10 going through the formal hoops, which tells its own story, I think. The standard survey, as I say, is much more complex. It's much more granular, 120 odd questions in total, but around 40 to 60, according to type of respondent, because there you declare who you are, what type of um, uh, role you're playing in relation to the directive. But as I say, from this very clear feedback that this easy reading format, it's popular and people can use it and they will give us their feedback. Now, when I shared this slide with Susanna, where are the challenges online? She was surprised, but very pleased that we were showing already some very preliminary results. Now, I stress these are preliminary. And as I will talk about for the next two or three slides, they are not representative. However, they also tell an interesting story because where you see, so we have two colors here on the left in the blue, we have the feedback from the easy reading, the much more popular survey. And on the right of the columns in the yellow, we have the formal, uh, have your say, open public consultation, the standard survey. But regardless of how the survey is completed, navigation followed by forms are the two winners of the most difficult parts of public sector websites to use award. Um, interestingly, not many more people saying everything's difficult than are saying everything's easy and we don't have any issues. So. It shows, I think, that there is not uh, an easy one size fits all in terms of making things accessible and in terms of users with disabilities, their experience. Um, but it also shows perhaps where we should be putting our attention because navigation isn't strictly speaking really a technical issue. It's much more a structural, uh, clear thinking issue and just having that awareness that you're going to have keyboard users or screen reader users from the start. So interesting, but as I say, not representative. Looking in terms of who's responded to it, and this just gives us a little bit more detail in terms of um, the popularity of the the survey showed here in blue, the, the easy reading survey, we have a lot of people declaring themselves as with a recognized disability or as considering themselves to be disabled, completing that more than we have without disabilities. But as I say, it's so much more popular. We shouldn't read anything in, or maybe we should read something into the fact that people without disabilities are also completing the simple 10 questions. Um, but we also see that we have older, using, older users using the easy to read format and uh, primarily the persons with disabilities are using it as well. And that really gives us a bit more, um, a bit more credence, I think, then to the issues that they were identifying that we saw in the previous slide, you know, navigation really being a key problem. So skipping over that, this slide shows the, the how those completing the more complex survey have declared their, um, their interest, really, who are they giving their contribution as. Um, so in a way, you could say, oh, the top three, they're representative, we've got the public, we've got public sector bodies, we've got industry accessibility experts, what's the problem? Well, what I'm really calling for your help on is that we don't actually have that much from industry, and there are certain sectors where we have no one signing up so far or giving their feedback. Now, we do expect more feedback the closer we get to the closure date, but I don't want to take that for granted. So I'm really calling on your help to get this out, particularly to industry, whether it's people offering training, offering solutions for assist, uh, accessibility services, industry organizations, but also more of the reporting bodies, that human rights ombudsman sort of complex around that. There's still lots of people out there that we want to hear from and 
also older people's organizations because as we, as we all know, preaching to the choir, accessibility is essential for some, but it's good for everyone. And a lot of older users, or even just users like me with my very big screen, because I realize I hate working on a tiny screen, we all benefit from accessibility features. So please help us get that message out to these different types of, of uh, correspondence. And here is my really big plea for geographical balance. Because as we see, bravo to Sweden and Finland, the Nordic Alliance comes through loud and clear, but we have an extremely long tail in terms of other countries taking part. And it's very important to us that we get geographically uh, a representative input into this public consultation. Because user experience in Sweden might be very different from that in Ireland or Luxembourg, Iceland or Malta. And we really want to be sure that the lessons we take are representative and that we're giving the right feedback and taking the right decisions, say feedback to the member states on how the legislation is being implemented, but then the decisions that we take in terms of future actions. Um, as Barbara uh, said, you know, the law, while we're continuing to check the law that's been transformed into the member states, is the law on the statute books is one thing, is the law actually making a difference to persons with disability going online for public sector services and information across Europe? That only comes from getting feedback from the user experience. So we're really calling for your help with that. So what's next? We have four more weeks of the user uh, survey being online, links and uh, QR codes here for you to link through to them strongly uh, recommend you to take part and share this on your networks. We're obviously very much looking forward to the discussion, the breakout panels that are going to come through next. And just one last thing I wanted to say about, uh, we've given links here to our website as well as some contact details. We are putting online very soon um, information to help people understand, I think, a bit more the articulation between the Web Accessibility Directive, the legislation, where the Etsy technical standard fits in with that and what is a harmonized European standard. And then how does that in turn connect with the WCAG guidelines, the WCAG guidelines? So uh, look out for that. It's not up there at this moment, but it should be up there before within the next couple of days. So uh, we hope that information will be useful there. And I've already shared a link in the chat where through those pages, you can come to a link of all the monitoring bodies that are active across Europe. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much in advance for the help you're gonna give us in sharing and completing the survey. And thanks for having us here this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. That was a very uh, swift and, and also detailed overview of where we are right now. And, and thank you for sharing all the details. I thought most of this was secret, but, but very good that we keep it transparent. And I've got a question, um, who is representing who here? So just the commission is of course responsible for the open public consultation, but the PricewaterhouseCoopers, Open Evidence and Funka has an assignment to support the commission in this study. So that's why we are kind of also um, engaged in this in this one. So thank you very much, June. Uh, and it's so it's so I'm so always so delighted to see that that this doesn't only matter to to Ursula von der Leyen, but also it matters to you. You're very dedicated and committed. And I think this engagement and inspiration is really needed to make to move things forward. And that is uh, it's really good to see also the whole team in the commission is really working towards inclusion uh, and not because it needs to happen, but because it's the right thing to do. So that's really, uh, really encouraging for all of us that have been doing this for, for many years. So now it's time for you, uh, dear friends, to be active here and help us and the commission in the breakout sessions. So we will have, uh, we will be magically transferred to three different digital rooms by uh, my colleague Rachel from IWP. Um, we have uh, three different topics. Everything is circulating or focusing around the directive, of course, but we are going to talk about what is not working so well, what is really working well, and what we would like to see happening in the future. So any improvements or changes or additions to the, to the directive that the Commission could, could work on. Um, and to help me with these breakout sessions, I have two very uh, good and inspiring uh, facilitators. So for the taking on the good parts, the positive parts, 
Uh, I have uh, with me Sabine Lopnik, uh, who is uh, working at the Global Accessibility Reporting Initiative of GARI, uh, and also is one of the co-founders of IWAP DAF, the German-speaking chapter of, uh, uh, of IWAP. So very happy to have Sabine on board. She's the most smiling and nice person in accessibility ever born, I think. So everyone in her um, group will be always good, taken care of in a, in a very good way. To her, to support Sabine, we have a note taker uh, so that she can concentrate on making everyone uh, contributing and uh, making sure that everyone can speak. So be nice to each other and let everyone speak. We, are, we have a lot of participants uh, and it's important that everyone has the chance to contribute. For the changes and um, improvements, potential improvements, we have the um, my other very nice friend, uh, the facilitator uh, Radek Pavlicek from the uh, Masaryk University in the Czech Republic. He is one of the um, one of the volunteers uh, supporting me for the IWP, IWP EU initiative. So he's also behind some of the webinars and, and newsletters and technology and all sorts of things that we are doing at the EU level. But um, uh, Radek will will take care of the sort of forward looking um, uh, group here and making sure that we collect all the good ideas for, for potential improvements. And I need to do the boring things of taking into all the problems and challenges and barriers. So in my group, we are gonna be the negative part, but, but so that's, uh, I'm, I'm sure we can do that in a good way. Uh, so we have 45 minutes to, for the discussions and then we'll magically be be transferred back into the panel discussions where where the facilitators will shortly report back on the results and then we will hopefully have a very good short discussion with uh, with June and Barbara and also potentially a Q&A with, with from everyone but it's a big group so i yeah we we'll have to see how many how many views we can have on this but but of course you're always welcome also to send in any comments afterwards if we can't just take exactly your question uh, on board here so with that, I would like to ask uh, Rachel to do the magic so that we are uh, getting into the, the breakout sessions and then we'll meet again, all of us at uh, 3.30 our time. Hello, Sabine. Good to see you. Now we are in the right place again. <laughs> I hope Radek is here as well. I see Emil, that's good, and Radek, good. Yes, so, I'm here as well. Yeah. Yes, that is good. Who wants to go first? Are you prepared to let us know what you have been discussing? I was thinking, I don't want to put you on the spot, Sabine, but it would be really nice to start with the kind of the positive things <laughs> for once, if you had had something positive to share from your... We had, we had. Okay, first of all, my group didn't even need me. They did a fantastic job without a facilitator. Uh, but anyways, so... Um, I didn't have time to exchange with my note taker yet, so I will go ahead and highlight what I took away as the main positive lessons. And then I would ask Emil that um, maybe you just complement whatever I have missed mentioning. We had a really nice geographical spread. So we had people from the UK, from Germany, from Turkey, from Norway, from the US also. Um, all aware of the Web Accessibility Directive and using them in different ways. So to highlight a few of the, the points why the Web Accessibility Directive is good and important. Uh, one that I really liked was that, well, it just shows the important, it makes it a serious topic because it is the law. So that gives it all the gravitas and all the credibility that comes with it. That was one important point. Also because it is the law and it is something important that makes it much easier to teach and to show students that they need to be aware of it. And moving on from that, so this is the stage we're in right now, a next step would hopefully be that it becomes basic knowledge. So that is just part of the basic liter um, literacy that you need for web or digital communication or just in general. Then one point that really several of the participants stressed and that I love myself is that with the requirements of the Web Accessibility Directive, one of the fantastic requirements is that you provide transcripts. And it was acknowledged that this can be a bit painful and involves more work in some instances. 
But on the other hand, and much more important, outweighing the negative is that it provides a fantastic new resource, an additional resource. It doesn't just make the content accessible, but it provides you additional resources that you can use in a longer time. So I would say this is one of the fantastic secondary benefits that maybe were not even thought of in the beginning. Then also, uh, we had several times that the Web Accessibility Directive is used as a guideline. So in addition to WCAG and also, in particular, also the countries that are not falling under the jurisdiction of the Web Accessibility Directive, they still look at it and find it a useful guideline to get additional clarification on accessibility requirements, additional guidelines and tips, and then also use it as a best practice in some instances. Then we heard it's useful to have it in the contracts because not everyone, maybe not even the majority, knows about accessibility and the requirements. But if you have it as a contractual clause, they at least need to read up on it and clue themselves up if they want to apply or submit um, a ten, uh, to the tender. We also heard that it's a very timely directive because the digital environment takes over and becomes so much more important. So having those basic guidelines that help us move towards making it truly accessible are very timely and very much needed. And so having the Web Accessibility Directive was definitely really appreciated. Those were my main points that I noted down. Emil, might I call on you to compliment me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, so we have a few uh, good quotes from uh, our session. Uh, oh, sorry, I can't turn on my camera. Uh, I'm not sure why. Um, so we had um, uh, we had one um, uh, one person who's working as an educator in the field of accessibility. Uh, who uh, is really stressing that she, she thinks that uh, the field of accessibility should be um, sort of a basic skill that's included in uh, every aspect of IT and design learning and not just um, for those specializing in that. Um, and she says that the directive supports this, that, um, you know, the idea that it shouldn't be a specialist competence, that it should be a universal knowledge that you learn, even if you do your university degree in a more technical subject. And so she thinks that the uh, directive uh, supports this, uh, this work in doing this. Um, we also heard from uh, one of our participants who is a, a screen reader user who uh, uh, says that the best thing for him with uh, the directive and by extension uh, WCAG is that when the web pages are good and they follow the directive and the uh, requirements within uh, WCAG, uh, then you can use them uh, in, without any problems with your screen reader, uh, things like that. Um, and uh, then we had uh, some of our friends from the uh, US who uh, have actually found uses for the uh, web accessibility directive. Um, in, in, in using it to compare and contrast with what's happening in the US and to find new best practices uh, and um, to sort of stay in the loop of what's, uh, what's happening. Uh, so those are some of the uh, uh, contributions that I picked up on in our session. Yeah. Perfect. So Susanna, if I summarize the two points, I think that really the most important was one, giving it the gravitas and importance of a law and the other was to provide a really good guideline even beyond Europe. I think that's the summary of all the advantages that we came up with. Yeah. So if I turn to you, uh, June, are you, are you happy with the results of the positive side? Is this what you expected for the <laughs> Accessibility Directive anniversary to, to give you as kind of the, the positive sides? Or, or, or do you kind of... Uh, recognize this from, from the discussions with the member states? 
No, I'm absolutely delighted. I think that's the best birthday present we could have hoped for for the ward. It was a very nice birthday present for the ward, sort of birthday present. Um, and really delighted to hear it being recognised as, as setting an example and, and giving guidelines internationally. Um, I, I mean, in our group, we had someone from Australia, which wasn't the sort of best group, but she was saying something similar as well. And that was something that I, I really hadn't thought of. Maybe we're just so caught up in the day to day sort of, oh, my God, let's get this working. And uh, and, and discussions with the member states that that really, um, uh, yeah, that was a gift. Thank you very much, whoever said that. Really made my day, and I'm sure the day of my team as well. And um, and really interesting to hear that people, a lot of people, just saying we need the law. You know, as I keep saying, it's a, it does seem to be this necessary but not sufficient condition. If it wasn't a law people wouldn't have to do it you know we've heard discussion it's a law without fines how do you imp how do you implement it that's a sort of separate discussion but if there wasn't the law would people be making the effort at all um, and I think that also speaks it seems to be very promising then for the European Accessibility Act when that comes into practical effect in you know two well three years time three and a bit years time soon but thank you very happy. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, we, we managed to, to create a birthday present. I'm happy about that. That wasn't really planned, but, <laughs> but it feels good. Uh, so, so thank you very much, Sabine and Emin, uh, for your presentation. So now I will go back to the slightly less positive part, which is kind of obstacles and problems. But I mean, that's what, why we're here. And also that's a big part of the, of the review to see what is maybe not perfectly working yet so that we can make sure that we support the member states and, and, and user organizations and accessibility experts and all other stakeholders so that, that it will become even better in the future. So in our group, we were talking about the feedback mechanism uh, in some countries, um, the Netherlands was taken as an example, the, the accessibility statement is not always present. And then that means that also the feedback mechanism is, is missing. And if you can't find it or you can't, uh, you don't know how to use it, then, then it's really hard for the end users to provide the feedback. And that to me, the feedback mechanism is one of the key points of the directive. So that was a little bit discouraging to hear, but of course it's a main obstacle. Uh, how do we make sure that the monitoring agencies really um, inform and enforce the public sector bodies to have the uh, have and use the feedback mechanism because I think that is really a, a key point here. So, so a very important obstacle. Um, and then uh, moving on to or continuing with the accessibility statement part of, of the issues is that uh, some some of the members in, in our group said that the accessibility statement is sometimes used as a Kind of an excuse to do nothing. So this example came uh, from both uh, Spain and, and Germany uh, in this case, um, but I think it was kind of a, um, something that has been seen in, in different countries. So um, uh, accessibility experts are, are providing expertise in making an audit, and then there is a document saying we are not accessible, and then everyone is moving on with their lives without making things accessible. So of course that is not the way the directive was meant to be. And that was absolutely not the way uh, the accessibility statement was supposed to be used. So this is extremely important information, I think. And I really look forward to, to getting more data on this uh, during the review process so that we can see if there is anything uh, that needs to be clarified or if the monitoring, um, uh, monitoring agencies need more support or you know so how, how this can be improved because I think this is clearly stated in the directive if you don't have an accessibility uh, I mean you can't just judge the accessibility by saying hey I'm sorry we are not accessible and then that's fine that is not how, how this is to be interpreted so very important feedback there um, then we had a discussion on what can be done by design or by default. So uh, interesting um, uh, discussion on, on kind of automating accessibility. And of course, that touches upon the, the big issue on overlays, but we didn't get into that direction. But, uh, but really trying to make sure that the software used, for example, the authoring tools or other programming tools for, for providing um, websites and apps, if they are made accessible from the start so that their output is, uh, is more or less accessible, at least the basic parts. Um, I was really happy to hear this from someone else than myself because this is what we have been trying to, to push for in some of our research projects lately. Uh, but really a lot of things could be, I am at least uh, sure that a lot of things can be provided by default uh, and, and by design 
from, for example, authoring tools uh, so that the web authors don't have to be accessibility experts. Of course, that won't fix everything, absolutely not, but um, quite a lot of the basic accessibility things shouldn't be possible to do any other way. Uh, we saw June showed the uh, statistics from the OPC right now saying that navigation and forms is one of our two of the biggest issues. And I mean, many of the forms editors that are built into uh, to authoring tools, they do by design standardized provide inaccessible forms. So if the web author doesn't know how to do this, the result is inaccessible. That is outright stupid. <laughs> if the authoring tool provided uh, forms editors that as a basic feature provided accessible forms, then that wouldn't be as big a problem. Of course, the web authors can still make mistakes, but if the, if the basic thing provided was accessible, then uh, many things would be easier. So uh, that led us into procurement discussion. So as the public sector bodies need to be accessible in their websites, then they should try to buy accessible authoring tools or authoring tools that provide accessible websites. That should be, even if that is not written directly in the law, that should be a logical move forward. Uh, and I agree with that, of course. So that was also, uh, that was from um, Germany now, from Mitchell. So, um, but I think that is also something that is true uh, in, in many countries. So. Procurement is a big problem. Many of the participants agreed on that. So either the procurement officers don't know how to, to write the requirements for accessibility and or the people who are accepting the, uh, the suppliers offers, they don't know how to check or control that is actually is accessible and, and how do we move on from there. So that's, that's also important. And I personally believe that procurement is, is one of the really important um, focus areas where we could we could do a lot of uh, more uh, work on this. Um, there was also a discussion about the complexity in scope. So uh, accessibility experts across Europe get a lot of questions. Am, am I in scope? Is my organization in scope of the directive? Or is this part of my intranet, for example, accessible? So, so the limitations uh, and thresholds and barriers and so on are, are is always a, or often a, a problem. And um, I think that is true, and it's also a little bit sad, I think, that people spend a lot of time thinking about, am I in scope or not? Why not just be accessible? But, but that is true. I've heard it from, from several uh, member states as well, and, and we also have that experience. So I think that is the complexity of, of, the, of the scope and kind of the, the limitations of, of the directive is, is also an, uh, a problem to many. And then we had uh, what I believe is... For the, at least for the web review, one of the most um, interesting thing is really when things are too costly. Uh, so the example was from a university um, with who are now um, providing captions, automatic captions, but they are supposed to be corrected by humans afterwards, of course, to, to comply. Um, and that is when the resources are not there. So how would the public sector body, in this case, a university, but any organization, how would they uh, fix that problem. If you don't have the time or money to do the human corrections, are you then just providing the automatic captioning as is? Is that kind of good enough? But I mean, it's not because it's not compliant. Uh, or would that mean that you stop uh, publishing your videos to comply? And that would be the worst, in my view, the, the worst uh, solution, of course, of, of any, any of this. So that is really kind of a balance where the, uh, where the directive, the, the, the legal requirements risks to push uh, the organizations over the edge in, in a direction that we are that we don't want them to move uh, if you know what I mean so that is I think it's a very very important point and and something we need to consider uh, how to to mitigate so that was uh, more or less the uh, the problem part John uh, did you have anything more did I forget any any good aspect or do you have any no I think you you covered everything there Susanna so that yeah Nothing more to add from my side. So June, um, this is a slightly less interesting uh, gift for you, but, <laughs> but uh, do you have any comments uh, on, on this, on the uh, problems and obstacles? I guess there's no news here for you. Yeah, well, and, th and that in, in a way is, is reassuring that there isn't anything major going on that 
that we're not aware of because it's always the unknown unknowns that, yeah. that can really knock you off course. And I think that's actually really, really interesting because it sort of confirms suspicions that we've had that we have to be very careful. For example, we've been thinking about accessibility statements and would that be a good a sort of proxy indicator for how member states are making progress? And one thing I was certainly concerned about was exactly this, that it's actually then super easy just to put an accessibility statement up saying nothing's accessible, never mind, we've got our accessibility statement. And that is totally, of course, not what we want to achieve. So, um, so that's interesting, yes. And this is also why sometimes, you know, it's a learning curve for us as well, but the law can have very perverse side effects. And obviously we want to take people with us. We don't want to um, say, you know, you've got to be perfect as on this day or not at all, because then people will just go for the not at all. And so there has to be this sort of gradation somehow of encouraging people and making it doable. I mean, it clearly has to be done, but also helping them along the way. And that's something that certainly with my team, uh, as you know, Susanna, that we put a lot of sort of time and effort into trying to encourage member states, encourage them to share their experience and trying to sort of, you know, have that rising tide of sharing knowledge and expertise and experience. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see the reports at the end of this year see what the member states say themselves about what they've achieved and where they've had problems perhaps. And this is also one reason, going back to what I was harping on about in the survey, that we really would like to get as many, for example, of those monitoring bodies, we'd love to hear from them really, what's their experience? You know, Are they finding that they're just a, a letterbox or are they actually being given resources to do their job as they would like to do it? You know, What's going on? And we'd really love to hear from, from all of those. So thank you again, all very relevant, very much appreciated. So, okay, now we move to the improvements. Radek. Yes, thank you. Uh, we uh, had also a very fruitful discussion with uh, more than 20 uh, suggestions. Uh, I tried to uh, distill, let's say, the most important or uh, those uh, which were mentioned uh, many times. So we also had uh, some nice quotes. So I will start with one of them. That the goal of accessibility is not to find issues, but to fix them. And what was mentioned as the let's say, first requirement uh, is a focus on usability, since many websites uh, often meet the wake up, but uh, are not still usable or uh, they are just technically uh, technically accessible. Uh, we should have usability as a criteria rather than just pure technical guidelines. So we should uh, uh, focus on user testing. And, uh, and there was also a suggestion uh, <clears throat> uh, for a mechanism for something like uh, a central inspector to ensure that the website is actually accessible, not just compliant with the uh, WCAG or approved by an external institution. So this was uh, what uh, this was uh, the requirement uh, which was mentioned uh, probably the most. Then that uh, the web accessibility directive uh, should also cover uh, the official content or the content which is uh, uh, published by uh, those uh, who are in a scope, uh, also on social networks, on social media, since um, many subjects uh, use uh, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter as their primary uh, channel for uh, uh, sharing information. And uh, this should be also uh, covered by uh, the legislation. Then better understandability, um, especially the definition of the mandatory subjects uh, that are bound by the accessibility directive should be made more understandable. That's uh, I see some overlaps what uh, was uh, mentioned uh, by you or but uh, by Sabine, and also plain and simple communication about what's important for people with disabilities uh, themselves, the differences in requirements. Uh, uh, between uh, the European Union and the national implementation of uh, Web Accessibility Directive uh, would be also nice. And the last point, um, it was uh, a kind of surprise for me. Uh, several times it was also mentioned that it would be uh, useful to have some fines 
the question was, uh, uh, will the Web Accessibility Directive ever be binding? The subjects uh, often don't react practically. There should be a fine mechanism and very similar uh, proposal was uh, having a fine when the requirements are not met is, is important. Some subjects uh, don't work on improving accessibility when they find there is no fine. So these are uh, three or four, uh, four uh, areas uh, for suggestions which were mentioned um, uh, the most. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you to all who joined uh, uh, this breakout room and thank you also to Lukáš uh, who uh, supported me with uh, taking notes. Thank you, Radek. So now, June, you will have, if, if we just put in a little bit more fines in the directive for the next, when, then, you can, then we can have a bigger party next time, because then I guess all the money will go to a fund for, for good parties for, for web celebrations. But so social media, um, social media coverage that's interesting in Sweden, actually social media is one of the, I mean, Sweden is one of the countries going beyond the directive minimum requirements, so we do cover social media. To some extent and the usability i think that's extremely uh, important and also what barbara was talking to you about in the beginning the problem i guess is that usability there are not so many kind of testable criteria right now so it would be hard to to make a standard of it but of course not impossible um but the fines part i think that is um that's politically a little bit tricky but what do you say june <laughs> Yeah, no, really interesting. One thing I could say is if there were fines, they would not be coming to us. That's really not how the EU financial system <laughs> works, I promise. And I want that saying on record. So, um, no, I mean, I think it's really interesting to see how, um, although, you know, this directive was adopted back in 2016, we're really coming now to sort of the crunch time of how is it working in practice? And, uh, and clearly in some places it's working a lot better practice than in others, and clearly it hasn't solved all the problems yet. Um, and really, I think the best tool, I mean, this is obviously putting the effort then on the person, on the user who's in the position of being really fed up because they can't do it, is complain, 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 use those monitoring bodies, you know, do that. And I know that takes time and energy, but that's the way the sort of the, the chain is set up at the moment. Sorry, someone just trying to, to disrupt me. Um, so, you know, that's the way the mechanism works at the moment. It's the only tool we've got, you know, all we can say is, use it you know we try to make the information available um and obviously it is your right now because it is there in european law and it has been transposed into all the member states so that's the only sort of tool there is but some really interesting ideas that came out of that group you know the fines the extension to social media the um the uh, references also to um you know having clearer stuff in public procurement contracts and what i would love to see but i'm not sure it's actually within the scope of the directive itself is that, you know, I think we all can see this potential for having a very virtuous circle of using uh, persons with disabilities to test more that gives you know decent jobs these can be gateway jobs to more tech jobs and that actually we could have a really virtuous circle of higher employability for persons with disabilities doing a job that needs to be done and improving the quality of public sector information and websites when it's never been more essential as we move towards this this uh, acceleration of the digital transformation so I would love to see that happening and if anyone's got any suggestions how we can do that then please let us know um, as I say, I think it's a bit beyond one single directive, but maybe with um, the Accessibility Act coming in and the whole market taking off more and that the extensions that come in from scope through the European Accessibility Act, maybe that can, um, can actually come to happen. Why not? Let's try. Okay, thank you very much, June. Thank you very much to everyone. I want to, again, give the floor to the end user perspective. So I read in the chat from Alf Lindberg, from who is from the hard of hearing uh, community um, at the European levels, that he had a very practical suggestion, which is that it's time to take away the exception regarding captioning of live videos. So I'll, I'll let that be the end of this um, of these recommendations. So thank you very much to my dear facilitators, note takers, all the, um, the interpreters. I, sorry, I don't have all, all of your names here, uh, but, but very fantastic. Good job, everyone. And thank you all the participants. We will save all the, uh, all the transcripts, of course, and make sure that this is uh, provided to the commission so that they can work on it and, and take, all, take note of all your recommendations and, and everything we have discussed today. 
Uh, so now please don't forget to answer and reply and contribute to the open public consultation and do reach out if you want to say anything else uh, and have your say and um, this really this is a democratic process and this is really for everyone for all stakeholders uh, and all everyone's voices is, is really important so thank you very much for being with us today and thank you for contributing in such a good way to this um, birthday celebrations and let's make this a tradition i think there's always room for more more parties so maybe next year this will be a um, a face-to-face -face party, who knows? But, uh, but at least we can keep on celebrating the work we do together. Uh, we can't maybe fix everything, um, but we can try to do the best we can stepwise. So please do reach out to us if you want to know more uh, and follow the IWP EU initiative. We have a brand new newsletter coming up every month and we will have webinars throughout um, October and November as well. So. Please follow us and keep up the good work. Don't forget to be inclusive and accessible in everything you do. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks.